Okay, today we're going to look at the French and Indian War. Um, as colonies, especially the French colonies and the British colonies, um, start encroaching into each other, this will lead into conflict. Of, um, but this is a conflict that you can... It's been brewing for a long time. Britain and France have become entangled in many different wars. They've been serious rivals for hundreds of years. You can look at the Hundred Years' War, and um, you also look at um, uh, three different wars from 1690 to 1750. So they're constantly in conflict. And when it comes to conflicts, um, these conflicts don't just center in, you know, the land of, you know, the, the continental France, French um, country and Great Britain. These take place all over where they have empires, anywhere where they have colonies. Um, so these, you know, these conflicts are usually not just centered in one place. They're usually like worldwide conflicts. And this, in the French Indian War, Seven Years' War, is included in like one of those global conflicts. It just doesn't take place here in the Americas. It takes place anywhere where British and French troops can meet. So in the 1700s, you see you know, territory um, that Great Britain is claiming. And then you look at territories that not necessarily the French are claiming, claiming, but they're claiming influence over because those are the areas where um, they've allied themselves with different native tribes to help facilitate the fur trade. And the main area that um, drives them in dispute is the Ohio River Valley that you see there shaded in red. It is in this area in which British colonists are slowly encroaching into this territory that is um, controlled and occupied by Native Americans who are allied with the French. And this, this is this area where these two empires will clash. Now, um, when we look at, you know, um, Americans going into the Ohio River Valley, they're being met with Native Americans who are well armed. Um, the French have long been trading in weapons for um, furs from the Native Americans. And in a sense, yes, they knew that these guns may probably be turned on the British. But like I said, British and French don't get along. And, it, you know, to them, that was more than fine. To the British um, colonists, they were seeing this as, French, as France inciting these natives and encouraging these natives to conduct raids against British colonists. So... Um, the French arming the, the natives, you know, is part of this whole concept of, you know, the, the French are trying to come and take our territory. They're using Native Americans, but it's really the French. And, you know, and this would, and it didn't help that the colonists kept occupying and spreading out their borders, going deeper and deeper into the Ohio River Valley. They're going deeper into this valley and they're, you know, like it's theirs for the taking, but it's already occupied by Native Americans. And you got to imagine what these Native Americans are going through, you know, it, you know, waking up one day and suddenly someone's building a house in your backyard. You know, they're waking up to people encroaching on their territory. And of course, if someone breaks into your home, they're going to defend themselves. So this leads to more and more conflict between the British colonists and these natives who are armed by the French and are aligned with the French. Benjamin Franklin does his best to try to organize the colonies and to defend themselves against these um, Native Americans. And he calls the Albany Congress together. He tries to get some delegates from different um, uh, different um, colonies, much like what later happened before the revolution, in which he called for this Albany plan of union for all of them to create a coordinated army so they could work together to fight off Native Americans. But a lot of people did want to join this plan. They were enjoying just being independent colonies. They really didn't have the resolve to really want to, you know, work together. And this is where this famous image that you've seen before. Polly thought maybe it was, you know, belonged to the American Revolution. But really it comes way before then in the conflicts between the, the British colonists and the Native Americans. So in 1754, you know, um, in order to really scout the, the Ohio River Valley, they hire a certain individual named George Washington. George Washington, you know, wasn't one of those wealthy, wasn't super wealthy. So he actually had to work for a living. And the job he had was he was a surveyor. He went out and measured lands. And he was he was tasked with the, um, with the job of going into the Ohio River Valley, 
uh, mapping the territory, seeing where settlements were, seeing where the French were, seeing where the natives were. And it's in this um, capacity that he runs smack dab into the French. Now, an interesting story is that um, G George Washington was, you know, traveling through the High River Valley. He didn't speak French. He was with some allies, um, with some native allies who were allied with the British who did speak French. They come across um, this Frenchman, you know, riding, riding in your area, and they jump him. And um, the natives are interrogating him because George Washington doesn't speak French. And they basically tell George Washington, this dude's a spy. He came to kill us. Can we execute him? He says, yes. And once they do it, you know, you do what you normally do when you kill someone. You go through his pockets. They find out he's a French diplomat, you know, on a mission of peace. Well, that peace was broken. And conflict breaks out throughout the Ohio River Valley. And in, in the midst of this conflict, this is where George Washington finds himself commanding troops. Um, he makes a good name for himself during the war. Although, like in this battle where they have to re retreat to Fort Duncas, nah, I can never say it right. Um, when they have to retreat there, you know, he puts up such a good fight that the French, even though they defeated him, they let him go. As you know, as long as they leave their arms behind, they let him go. And but you know, it, this you know, it's this incident. And some others where um, George Washington kind of like you know will later lean on this when he starts to advertise himself as the man for the job when it comes time to, to find a general to lead the Continental Army. And he is one of the few founding fathers who does have combat experience. So the French Indian Wars, 19, you know, runs some 1715 for 1763. And the lines are like this. It is French and a whole lot of native allies and is the British and some native allies. Most, na most natives were allied with the French because um, the, they were making good business in the fur trade. Um, but there were conflicts among different tribes of Native Americans who were also wanted in the fur trade. So they got jealous and they would fight over territory. So those that were, you know, fighting against the tribes that are aligned with the French, they would um, align themselves with the British, but there wasn't as many that would align with themselves with the British than there were with the French, but hence the name, the French and Indian War. Um, but like I said, this battle, this war, once they go to war, they go to war everywhere. And so this war is spans throughout the globe. And that's why it's referred to mostly in Europe as the Seven Years' War. Now, when it comes to the war, um, you have to understand that um, because it's such a big war, and like it's referred to, like I said, the Seven Years' War is being fought. People are attacking Great Britain all over. You know, Spain's trying to regain land. You know, it's, France is attacking them, not only here, but not only in the Americas, but back in Europe. And this becomes a war that in which, at the very beginning, the British don't do very well. You know, they're not used to the fighting tactics of Native Americans. Um, and they just don't have the support they need at the very beginning of the war. And so, you know, this has given England a black eye. So the, uh, they need more and more support. And in order to get that support, this is done by raising taxes. Raising taxes mostly in Great Britain. In fact, the Prime Minister William Pitt gets what we call a blank check to fight the war, meaning as much money as you need to fight this war. So they begin to pour tons of money into this war. And eventually they're able to overcome the French forces, able to be, defeat the French. And in the Treaty of Paris in 1763, um, the war comes to an end. And it, it includes some concessions. France loses Canada and most of its empire in India as well. Um, it, it, the claims, any claims it has east of the Mississippi, it's given up. You know, and England claims all French lands in Canada and, and uh, control the Caribbean slave trade. Spain gets all of the lands west of the Mississippi River, New Orleans, but loses Florida to England. They're just basically redrawing the maps of North America with the war. But something bigger comes out of this war, and that is the relationship the British colonists have with the mother country. Um, this relationship starts to change after the French and Indian War, and it changes on both sides. It changes with the British colonists, and it changes back home. You know, to begin with, the colonists were immediately elated because now the French aren't supporting the Native Americans of High River Valley. In, in a sense, they've gained those lands, and now they want to make their way in there and spread their territory. 
and on the uh, and another seed of doubt is planted in their heads, and that is the fact that they used to fear the British Army. They used to, the British Army was the greatest army in the world at that time, and they were scared to death of them. But when they fought alongside them and realized that even in their brains, savages were defeating them, well, maybe they're not so tough after all. And they begin to see different tactics used against the British that were very, very effective. And, you know, if you can, I mean, I'm sure you've seen movies where the soldiers would line themselves up in lines and stand like a, some yards away and open fire. It seems stupid to stand there and aim in a whole group. But in reality... Back then, rifles didn't have the technology of rifling. Rifling is a process in which you put grooves inside a barrel, and this causes the bullet to spin. And when, you, when the bullet spins, it flies in a straight you know, direction. It goes straight. One, one good example is a football. If you see a quarterback, he throws a perfect spiral, goes straight. If it's all wobbly, it goes all over the place. So the guns they were using back then, these muskets that didn't have rifling, that meant the bullets went all over the place. You could literally stand in front of a, you know, a couple of feet away from something and miss. So literally, you did need 10 to 15 guys all pointing their guns, and maybe you would hit something. But this, these tactics did not work in forests. It didn't work. Native Americans used different type of guerrilla techniques. They weren't lining up. They were hiding behind things. You know, in fact, back then, because the muskets were so in inaccurate, the bow and arrow was much more accurate, and it could fire faster than a musket. So, you know, the, the, the British colonists, who later become Americans, are, are seeing all these weaknesses of the British troops, and suddenly those guys aren't so tough anymore. So something that might keep them and make them behave suddenly doesn't become, you know, is no longer a deterrent for, in a sense, misbehaviors. Now, at this point in time, Great Britain is literally tired of the colonies. Most of the wars that I, when I talk about, oh, the, the, they had the war against the Pequots, that war against, you know, different groups. Those wars were fought and paid for by Great Britain, yet they never started any of these wars. It was the colonists that were constantly starting wars that Great Britain had to pay and fight. And it's like a little brother who always picks a fight and the big brother has to come step in. And in a sense, England was always paying for the stuff that America broke. And the French and Indian War was really, you know, the breaking point for the British people. They were like, you know what? We gave you all this freedom and look what you did with it. You know, we let you have the house for the weekend. You throw a big party. Everything's all broken. And you, this is the third time you've done this. You know, that's it. You know, we need to do something about it. And so, um, sorry, let me back up a little. So when you look at what's going on, you know, the British are actually looking at America in a very different light. And then they're realizing it was just costing so much money to constantly have the army in, in the Americas because these guys keep stirring up trouble. In fact, shortly after the French and Indian War is over, and England is looking at all this debt created by these British colonists, and they're trying to like figure out what to do. Immediately afterwards, these British colonists pour into the Ohio River Valley and start yet another war, known as Pontiac's Rebellion. And it is another war in which the British government must send more troops and cost more money, increasing more taxes, back in Great Britain. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. That was it. You know, um, just as they were trying to like punish them for what, you know, the French and Indian War, here comes another war they started. And each of these wars was not a, a planned by England. It was not something England wanted. But these colonists keep instigating more and more fights, costing more and more money that Great Britain now has to pay. And that really is when Great Britain decides, you know what, we gave you all this freedom and look what you did with it. You know, we just can't trust you anymore. We can't trust you at all. So it's at this point that they decide to change gears and start treating the colonies in a very different manner. The first thing they do 
after Pontiac's War is the proclamation of 1763. And I'm sure you've heard no taxation without representation and all kinds of other stuff for the cause of the American Revolution. But the people that were impacted by the proclamation of 1763, those number, the number of people impacted by that was much less than the ones impacted by the Stamp Act and the Sugar Act and so forth. Because what this basically said is that Americans or British colonists at the time could not expand their territories beyond the Appalachian Mountains, which is where that little maroon line goes on the, on the map. They're saying no more expanding territory because every time you expand territory, you start another war with another native group and then we have to fight it and we have to pay for it. So no more. And this upset a lot of people. People living on the edge of the borders were looking to push out. There were other people, including George Washington, who were already speculating and landed the Ohio River Valley, in a sense, selling land they didn't already have possession of. So once they cut this off, there goes all this investments. So a lot more people are impacted by the proclamation of 1763. And they were, you know, the people were just livid. They, you know, a lot of the, Brit the British colonists who fought alongside the British army did so because they thought, you know, once this war is over, we get land in the Ohio River Valley. And all of a sudden, the government says, no, you can't. Because you just can't behave yourselves. And this was a, and this is one of those things you hear, non, no taxation or representation. But this was also a move done back home without the say-so of the British colonists. They took it once again as, you know, their voice is not being heard. And so it, um, Great Britain brings about the end of what we refer to as salutary neglect. They kind of let the colonies be on their own. As long as they were, you know, producing goods Great Britain needed, you know, they left them alone. But now they're not making money for Great Britain. They're costing money for Great Britain. And they've already shown they just can't behave themselves. After the French Indian War, they just go and start another war which the British people are having to pay for, and they ain't too happy about it anymore. So all of a sudden, it's not just the proclamation of 1763, it's the fact that they just don't trust them anymore. You know, we gave you all this freedom, and look what you did. You know what, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're gonna ground you. We're gonna take away all your rights and privileges. They're gonna take away all your local government. From now on, we're gonna install British officials to run the colonies because you've proven you don't know how to behave yourselves. And so they start to limit all these rights and all these privileges. They start to limit local government. From now on, they have to do what the crown says, and that's it. So suddenly they start passing all those taxes and without the input of the colonists and in and they're being enforced by the british army they're being enforced by new governors and they just don't like it they've you know all the freedom they used to have has suddenly been taken away you know the, the british government is just so done with what they look like you know look at as teenagers who don't know how to behave themselves so with the end of salutary neglect and more control being placed upon um, the British colonists, this is what really stoked the fires for independence.